Welcome to the podcast from Heartache to Healing and Hope, Season 2, Weathering the Storm, Cultivating Kindness. And I'm your host, Bernadette Winters Bell. Welcome to my podcast, From Heartache to Healing and Hope. And don't I have a very special guest for you today. This is Nick Kelsch. He has a very eclectic and interesting background. Nick, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Now, Nick, I'm pretty sure that of the two of us, you're the one that knows you the best. So would you introduce yourself to my audience, please? Okay, here's, let me see if I can do this in like 30 seconds. Born and raised in Fargo, North Dakota. Yes, that Fargo, North Dakota. Check, got uh, it. <laughs> yep. Um, we knew I wanted to be a photographer when I was in the ninth grade and never, ever looked back. Wow. Uh, when I was 20 years old, I quit college for one year and I went and worked for the Belfast Telegraph in Belfast, Northern Ireland to cover the war there. Ooh. And then came back to journalism school at the University of Missouri and made lots of interesting, incredible friends. It's kind of oh. a, it's a well-known journalism school. I was not their star pupil, so I get to say that. Um, <laughs> They uh, left there and then worked for various newspapers around the United States, ending up at the Philadelphia Inquirer, big newspaper. Left in Philadelphia, and what, what did I do? I, oh, and then I left the Philadelphia Inquirer to start a graphic design firm with a really good friend of mine. And while running that firm, I started photographing babies, like Mm -hmm. friends, babies of friends and employees. And I collected a set of baby photographs and they were all naked. There were no, there was no clothing allowed in these photographs. And then somebody, or actually not somebody, three different women said to me, you need to get Anna Quindlin (laughs) the writer to write this book with you Mm. and I tracked down Anna Quindland it was amateur detective hour tracked her down and talked her into it on the phone I'll keep this story relatively short I said Anna we have mutual friends I've got some photographs I'm looking for a writer and she goes I'm sure they're wonderful photographs I can't do another project I'm really sorry I said will you do me a favor We had just look at the pictures. She said, okay, I'll look at the pictures. Anna is like a really wonderful person. So we had this 45 second conversation. So I pack up these, my 10 greatest naked babies photographs, which ended up being the title of the book, Naked Babies. And Anna sent me, I FedExed them to her. The next day she called me up. Oh no, she didn't call me up. She, She sent me an email and said, why the hell didn't you tell me these were pictures of naked babies? Of course, I'll do this project. Uh, yeah. So we did two books together and we were on, I'm supposed to tell you this stuff on these, you know, I, we were on the Today Show a couple times together. We were on uh, Oprah uh, a few times together. And um, then a publisher in New York, this is like r- way longer than 30 seconds. I'm so sorry. Um, a you pub- put you put that um, boundary on it. Yeah, I'm I did. Fine. I did. <laughs> okay. A somebody saw me on Oprah and called me up and said, "Hey, you want to write a book about photographing babies? Because everybody out there is going to want to know how to take pictures like this." And I said, "Sure." So I that was the first of the nine books that I wrote for amateur photographers. Now I have a website called How to Photograph Your Life, and I teach amateur photographers how to photograph just like the title says their lives and that's where i am now i mean why i actually i'm in a little town in upstate new york treadwell and that that is a whole nother segment of the story i haven't told you right now okay how i got here (laughs) wonderful well that's pretty interesting 
Um, what happened when you were nine that you knew you wanted to be a photographer? Well, that's very interesting that you should ask that. Um, what happened was one thing, one thing that happened and was a totally memorable and life-changing experience almost. And I have never forgotten the power of, and I share with other younger photographers now. I was in the ninth grade. I went to a high school picnic, but I was the school photographer, but it was everybody else in the, in, at the picnic was older than me. It was for the high school, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And there were two like super popular, really good looking guys who were jocks and they were like really cool. And I got up the nerve to, and I said, hey, you guys, can I take a picture of you? And they sure. And I posed them, there was a, they got, they got behind a bush and there was a hole in the bush and they put their faces through the bush. And I took a picture and a short time after that, after the faculty advisor for the yearbook got the photographs, he walked down the hall and stopped me in the hall and said, I gotta tell you something, this is the best photograph taken by a student I've ever seen. Wow. Yeah. And I'm sure if you looked at it, it's the amateur hour, you know, but um, let me put it this way. The bar wasn't too high on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but you reached it and surpassed it anyway. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I got a big pat on the back early and then we moved into a house and uh, this guy left a lot of serious darkroom equipment from like 1948, Ooh. you know? Yeah. And uh, so I like figured out how to do it. And uh, so then I um, went, to, I went to one year of college locally in Fargo at North Dakota State. And then I took a year off and I went and worked for the Belfast Telegraph, which was the big newspaper in Belfast. And this is like in 19... 72. This is at the height of the troubles in Belfast. People are being killed and car bombs are going off. Was that hard to get that to get that job? That was that a time? weird. All you had to do was write a letter to Eddie Sterling. And he said, this kid sounds pretty interesting. And he wrote me a letter and he said, if you come on over here, I'll give you a little bit of money to live on and you can stay for a year. It was insane. Yeah, really. It was insane on his part. I mean, what you think about insurance implications and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, I, I got a four minute story about Belfast. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, I do. Okay, Absolutely. well, so I'm walking down the, I get off the train in Belfast on a Sunday morning, like at 7 a.m. I got all my gear. I don't even know where I'm going. Don't even know where I'm living. And, I, and I'm I walk to the Belfast Telegraph office and they had a whole bunch of glass enclosed pictures taken from Belfast, wrapped all the way around the building. Belfast Telegraph is still a large newspaper. It was a large newspaper then. And it was like all these you know, pictures of cute puppies and women with cleavage, which is what British photographers like to photograph, right? Mm -hmm. But then there were like three photographs there of like IRA guys with masks on practicing shooting out in the, in the woods. And I'm looking at this stuff because I wanted to go there and cover the war. Right. And this guy comes up to me and he walks up behind me and he goes, you must be Nick Kelsch. Right. And it wasn't John Lennon, but um, <laughs> he, you must be. And he, he, he was, he was from Scotland and, and uh, England. And he goes, I'm a photographer here. I took these photographs and it was the guy who shot the war photographs. And he goes, wow. Do you need yep, yep, yep. I have fantasized for years. I fantasized about the screenplay. I would write about this guy. And he, he from day one took me under his wing and took me to his house for dinner countless mm. times. And then with the part of the insanity comes in, he took me out into the, into the depths of like the danger zones. Yep. And um, he, uh, 
he was tight with both the IRA and the UDA, which was the uh, Ulster Defense Association. Mm -hmm. But they were the it was the uh, um, Catholics and the Protestants, militant right. Catholics and Protestants, right? And he was he knew everybody. And he was the war photographer. There were 12 staff photographers. The other 11 photographed puppies and women with big breasts. And he photographed the real stuff. And I went to many car bombings with him. And they would, which that's when the British Army would blow up a car because they suspected that it was a, uh, a bomb. Anyway, cut to the very chase. The last day I was there, I'm at his house for dinner and knock, knock, knock at the door open the door two men in suits are standing there may we come in and they came in and pulled guns on us yep and they had long story but they were two ira men and they had been following my friend david his name was david and they knew they told him everything he'd done for the last month you went to a movie you went and got your clothes fixed we've been tracking you for a long time what are you up to and he was suspicious because he was friendly with all of the with both sides of the troubles as they call it mm -hmm. they had us on the floor on our stomachs his 80 year old aunt was there she was on her stomach i was throwing up she was crying everybody had guns in the backs of their heads and um, I got to tell you, they had no idea what to do with me. I was this American who wasn't supposed to be there. Mm. And David later, much, after much conversation about this stuff, he's like, you know, they might have just let us go because you were there. Because are we going to, these guys are like, are we going to kill an American now? Right. And the reason they thought they might get killed is because these guys weren't wearing masks. And when they don't wear masks, that's when they kill you because they're not leaving witnesses. Right, right. If they have a mask on, that means they're leaving. Oh. Right? So anyway, they leave. They walked away. And uh, the editor of the newspaper got on the phone with the American consulate the next day. And, and he said, I've already booked your flight. You're going home today. <laughs> Yes, the mentorship is over. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, um, came back home, went to the University of Missouri. Uh, it's a great journalism school. Met lots of interesting people. Came, got out of there. Worked for many newspapers around the United States. Started a graphic design firm in Philadelphia. Did that for a period of years. One day, I decided to photograph babies of employees and i don't know why i did this i don't know i like babies what can i tell you so i said anna we've never met i have a set of photographs i'm a photographer in philadelphia she is so nice she didn't hang up the phone she said i'm sure it's a wonderful set of pictures i'm too busy i can't take on another project thanks anyway i said look can i just send you the photographs and you'll look at some pictures she goes okay i'll look at some pictures <laughs> so i put together a fedex box that day and i fedexed it to her and the next day she emailed me and i still have the email someplace but she said why did you not tell me these were pictures of naked babies of course i have to do this project and she came on i mean she wrote the most beautiful thing ever written about like i mean of babies and how beautiful they are and it was like unbelievable and we and then we did another book called siblings too mm. and we were on uh the today show a couple times and oprah three times and um still friendly with anna and so then somebody saw me on oprah and a, a book publisher in New York and called me up and said, Hey, you want to write a book? And so on the base, sure. Okay. And as, and as the, the um, uh, on the basis of one phone call, you know, I'd never written a book. Mm -hmm. And so they hired me to, we signed a contract and I said, what do you think about this for a title? How to photograph your baby? And they were like, well, that's done. Wow. Yep. And so they barely changed a word. I mean, it, it was, 
And it, the book, I, it, I don't think you can order it on Amazon anymore. This is like 20 years ago, mm. but it was out there for a long time. And then I did eight more books for amateurs that, that are almost all out of print. <laughs> And so now I've ended up here in a little town in upstate New York, near where my wife was born and raised. And I have for a long time been teaching photography on the internet. I mm -hmm. teach workshops around the country. We could talk about that because it has a lot to do with how I behaved during COVID, which was I stayed home. But um, so that's what I, now I'm like an internet teacher guy. Which is what many people became yeah. or evolved to. Yeah. So what I often ask people is I share that I learned that after World War I, when people would meet one another, having not seen them for a while, perhaps, would ask, how was your war? Because, of course, the methods of communication were a lot different than today. Yeah. And that's how they got to know how they survived it, whether they were in the war or keeping the home fires burning, so to speak. Yeah. So how was your pandemic, Nick? Well, my pandemic was odd. Um, so we had all already launched a lot of uh, uh, workshops, generally about 12 people mm. around the country, you know, in the major, in the usual spots, but beautiful spots, New Orleans and San Francisco and the balloons and Albuquerque and all this. And we, and we had uh, like 10 of them um, scheduled for around the country. And then COVID came mm. and my wife spent a lot of time canceling suites of 10 hotel rooms, you know, that we had booked. And so then not quite spontaneously, but kind of serendipitously is that the word mm -hmm. um we were introduced to a man who was setting up a home for foster kids in this little town of treadwell mm. and we spent 11 months with over the course of 11 months five different kids in a with and i have two kids sons of my own mm. and my i have an old i gotta I also have to mention i have a son who's a an attorney in Boston. So I, I have three sons, two of them live with me now. So we had six and seven kids in this house and it was tough. It was tough. I'll bet it was. I mean, first of all, um, it's, it's a new space for them. It's a new yeah. space for your family with them in it. Yeah. COVID is new to everyone. How do right. we behave? Right. Every day right. became different. You know, I remember that it first happens and we all think, hmm, a couple of weeks, we'll be fine. Okay, when spring is over, we'll be yeah, fine. I know. I know. And summer, oh, it's summer, it's warm, it's not so bad. And we all had an anticipation with no real reason to, that it was going to be better in the fall. And we learned it became exactly the opposite. So yeah. We were constantly trying to change and process the information and live. So I can only imagine how difficult it was in the house. Yeah, we had, I mean, you know, masks and arranging for schools for these kids. And right. it was which uh, all that, that office uh, paperwork stuff got dumped on my wife. And mm -hmm. um, it was, I mean, we really got a big taste of a system that is just barely scraping by mm. and throw in kids who are obviously you can imagine every kind of damage they have but mm. um uh violent and it it was <laughs> it was tough yeah. It was tough. I mean, and then we learned that, you know, it's people like us, people who say, well, we just want to make the world a better place. And then you find out later that we're like these, we're the standard person who comes in and you say that. And the people who run the place say things like, well, we've seen people like you before, you know, you just, you get kind of get chewed up and spit out. Right. Right, the the uh, wolf goes after the lamb and uh, attacks right. it. 
and then exactly says, right. okay, how long are you in this for? Sure. Yeah, it was like 10 and a half months or something like that, hmm. which was actually a long time. Well, when you're in it, it's forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah. But I mean, you know, here's the deal. Every kid was a good kid. Mm. That's, you know, I could still, I can still go down the list and say, well, she was a good kid and he was a good kid. But when you, when there, are, when, when stuff starts falling apart, then it's not so good anymore. But, you know, they're damaged. Yes. I mean, it's, it's like heartbreaking. Absolutely. And this wasn't just one child or no, parents, right. siblings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, whenever we go through as humans, a loss, a trauma, someone's death or death to a situation, say, yeah, um, we revert to our practice coping skills. We don't think about it. We just do this. Mm -hmm. And if your coping skill is to shut down or to rage or whatever might have used in the past, not necessarily successful or negative, you just go to that. Mm -hmm. and that's where you see it gets amped up everyone's reactions mm -hmm. um, and becomes really tragic in the situation because everyone is operating um, right on the edge of their little cliff. Yeah. 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 We had no experience, you know. Right. We were inexperienced. <laughs> Let me just say that. We were, right. We're right. undertrained. I mean, it's, it's, you can't train people. It's, I don't know. Well, it wouldn't hurt. Yeah, they, you know, tr at least they tried. They, right. Right. That's the, that's the, boy, that was some kind of learning experience. It so was. To speak. And, it, and right. as my son said, my my 16 year old son mm. said, well, at least I have my college entrance exam idea finished. <laughs> He's all finished with that essay. <laughs> Why I want to go to college. <laughs> yeah, I said, you know, that's not a bad idea. We should down and take some notes right now while it's fresh that's in our right. minds. Absolutely. Right. Well, it's certainly um, a teaching moment for all of you. A moment, a month, uh, you know, a thesis, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. And so how was your COVID post being parents or foster parents? After the, after the foster kids. Mm. Um, pretty good. I mean, I have been very impressed with the way my 16 year old and 13 year old have both come out of the fog. Mm. My 16 year old's at the top of his class in, in a pretty big high school. And in my um, 13 year old is in the top 5% at least of his class. And he's the, the, the biggest pain for him was mm -hmm. during COVID because we came up here and one of the selling points for him was that he, we came from a Waldorf school in Philadelphia, if you know what that is. Well, I do, I something. do. The Waldorf school doesn't have a football team, much less a baseball team or a soccer team, or, <laughs> you know. And my kid's not gonna play football, but he's gonna play everything else. And he, so we came up and toured the school up here in New York mm -hmm. one weekend and they sent, they gave us a kid to walk us through the empty school. And there was a second floor view looking out on this massive, big, recently renovated athletic playing fields and facility. And he walked over to me and he goes, Dad, this is all I've ever dreamed of. Oh, were you at the dreamed. Academy in Delhi? Yeah, Delaware Academy. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, and so he, go ahead. No, it's so different from where you were. It couldn't yeah. be any more different. That's, that's pretty much accurate. So yeah. then when COVID came, all the sports got shut down. Oh. So not only is he not going to sports, he's staying home with the four foster kids who, you know, none of which were, whom were interested in sports at all. And, right. And, uh, they wanted to play their um, electronic gimbo, you know, gadgets and right. 
And he's home with his sibling and his parents. And not that I'm sure you're all exactly. lovely people, exactly. but exactly. as a 16 year old, that's not exactly where that's you exactly want to be. Right. That's exactly right. So, and that was the difficulty with so many families, whether it was everyone was working, whether it's work or school, whatever, out of the home in different yeah. places. And when is lunchtime? You know, there's no bell that goes off. It's almost yeah. like you have different periods or, you know, to be able to do all those things. And how do you stay out of one another's hair and support one another? It becomes, you know, we're used to the um, boundaries that a job or school generally provides. I go to this place and then come home. I go to this place and come home. And, we, and so we had figured out our lives around these boxes, so to speak. Yeah. And when we all lived in the same box, <laughs> that's really hard. Yeah. yeah. And they kept changing it. Okay, you're in school. Okay, you're yeah. home. Okay, it's hybrid. You're yeah. sometimes in school and sometimes home. Yeah, yeah that's that makes it all so different. So I, I said to my kid, my 16-year-old and 13-year-old, like last week, I said, what's the deal? Are you guys, are, are you guys going to have to... Um wear masks this mm. year and they were both like oh we i don't care about masks they were like but if we have to stay home and do re do remote learning that's bad news that's going to be uh, bad news so they're okay with the mask isn't that funny how they they're, can adjust yeah, maybe easier than adults you i know? know i gave a bunch of basketball players to ride home from a basketball game one day and they had all <laughs> worn masks during the basketball game and I said, how is it wearing masks? No big deal. Right. Right. Not a big deal. We think it's a big deal. Isn't I can, it? I got to tell you something. I don't think I could go to an office and wear a mask all day, every day. I don't think I could do that. I, I, if I, I bet you could. Yeah. If that's where your job was and that's where your income was coming from, but you have a choice. Yeah, and exactly. So it's, it's it's different, no different than when we were first starting. We'd wear the mask when we went to the grocery store. This is so hard. I can't wait to take it off. And after a while, you just had it on like all the time. You know, we we're yeah. pretty yeah. adaptable creatures. You know. Yeah. 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 Wow, that's been an amazing thing. And in the meantime, have you been having online workshops, Nick? Uh, some, but not that. And now we're really trying to get that good going right now and so now you know with covid coming back the way it is like right. we are now it's the second round of calling the same hotels oh. and although there aren't as many hotels but like we got to cancel our you know 10 room reservation for october 17th you know and that's a drag wow and do you have that many people working with you 10 rooms that's a lot uh, well, you know, I'm, I may, I say 10, you know, people share rooms and stuff like that. It's not working right. with us. It's, uh, you know, we get like 12 people to come to these things. So whatever it is, they, they okay. share, rooms. maybe 10 is, is more than it's, No, it's, no, no. I'm just imagining yeah. what your entourage is. <laughs> My entourage is uh, two other people. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Could you it's have fun. Another? It's fun. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. this is, I've been finding this a blast. Um, could you ever have imagined where you are now? Where you're living, where you're working, everything? No, no, yeah. no. Um, I do know this. I did have, uh, and I was inclined to, I can flash back in some moments when I was young, mm -hmm. where I helped amateur photographers on the street. And like, and one of one time was at, so I wasn't so young, so I must have been like thirty. Mm -hmm. But I was at the Philadelphia Art Museum, the Rocky Steps. Yes. And and there's a so there's a, a load of uh, there's a group of Japanese tourists. On the and the guy is trying to tell the you know he's taking a picture a group shot of fifty people right, but his camera's not working. Oh. So I just walk over there and I go, here, I'll help you. And let me see what's wrong. And I don't even know what was wrong. Right. And I fixed it right away. And I said, now you go get in the picture. I'll take the picture. Right. And so I'll take a picture. And, um, and then there was another, photo another photographer there with me. And he said to me, 
why would you bother to do that? Mm. Right? I know. And, and which is, I've spent a lot of time around like hot shot, famous photographers around the world and stuff. And that is like a general, now, now I'm bad mouthing photographers, but it is a general uh, way of behaving for a group of people. I, okay, I, I shouldn't even go there. So I said, I'm happy to do it. I like doing this, you know? And, uh, and like when going on Oprah and t telling somebody how to photograph a baby, it was fun for me. Absolutely. Isn't it wonderful when we have the opportunity to do something that we're skilled at, blessed to know, yeah. and then we're able to share it with others. It's not yeah. something like the secret of, I remember one time, I have over 30 years working at hospices, and there was yeah. a woman who had a, a recipe, I think it was chocolate chip cookies, but anyway, she wouldn't share it with the family. You know, it was the famous recipe. And she always said, you know, I'm never giving this recipe out over my dead body. And what her kids did, it was pretty damn funny, um, on her headstone, <laughs> said, on the bottom recipe, maybe it said for the cookies, I don't remember. Um, That's awesome. Over and on the back of the stone, they put oh the my recipe. Gosh. It was oh, so is, funny. It was so that funny. Is funny. Absolutely. And so... You know, sometimes oh. we won't share because yeah. someone would have a picture as good as mine or my yeah, cookies would taste the same or, well, that is kind of in a way an American way of being, you know, this mm -hmm. independence and, you know, um, and keep going and going and going, assuming that as we're going up, we're improving, which isn't necessarily true on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And that stopping to help somebody takes something away from us. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah. We feel good about helping and we've helped yeah. somebody, you know, who may yeah. remember that for the rest of their life. Like the mentor, when you were photographing the jocks looking through the, yeah. the bush, right? Yeah. You, you remember that to this day. Yeah, I know. You know, it's just amazing. What it is happened. amazing that you've been able to share and do all this. And so what would you like to do photography wise going forward? That's a really good question. You know, my generic answer has always been, I want to make something beautiful. Mm -hmm. And um, I, right now I feel like I am in a position to, uh, um, make little tiny short videos okay we have a i have a website i'm not i'm trying not to plug but i'm oh no go it's, ahead it's, it's called how to photograph your life is the okay. name of our, our and and that's the same how to photograph your life is also our facebook page and on mm -hmm. our facebook page every day six days a week i take a picture that someone's posted on our facebook page and I talk about it and review it and mm. right and say, here's why this picture, mostly it's here's why this picture works so well. You know, right, I, don't, right. I don't bash too many people, right. but um, I've been doing that almost six days a week for 10 years. Wow. That's a long time there. Yep, it is. It is a long time. And now, so I have a massive collection of really good photographs taken by amateurs. And so now I'm making videos. It's of me talking about one image for, and considering it from all angles and who's in the picture and what's she thinking. And so they're like two or three minutes long, right? Right. And I've just started working on that. And I'm having this vision now. This just could be a, these could be little works of art. And whether they go on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, they, I don't know. I don't know. But also, I want to I want to do what we're doing right now, which is like talk to somebody who's got a pile of photographs and help them become a better photographer, which yeah. I have done. I've done Zoom meetings with other mm -hmm. photographers. But it totally works. And it's kind of like makes me wonder why I have to get on an airplane and fly to San Francisco, you know? Well, isn't that something... 
you know, we learned so many things from COVID. You yeah. know, I call it the yeah. gifts of the yeah. pandemic. Yeah. Um, and that's not to uh, slight all the difficulties and the deaths, yeah. but there's always gifts that come from these kinds of situations. And yeah. Yeah. it made us all rethink, or some people were already there, but to say, well, here we are, we didn't have to come to the same place. Although turns out geographically, you and I aren't too far apart at the moment, but right. you know, I could be on the beach in Hawaii. I am so not, but right, 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 right. You know what I was thinking, Nick, as you were talking about helping people with photographs and it popped into my head about the babies. Um, I always find it interesting what children look at things like to see things oh. through their eyes. Well, so it, yeah, if yeah. you had children looking at a photograph or photographs, to say, what do they see? What do you think the person is thinking? All those questions that you pose. Okay, well, I did a workshop uh, at a nearby, at the at the, the Bright Hill Literary Center mm -hmm. here uh, about three weeks ago. And it was an iPhone, which I love my iPhone. I love my iPhone. But it, it was an iPhone uh, workshop for kids. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a blog about this, which was, it was a five day workshop. I had itinerary set up for five days, right? And when, so I get these kids coming in there and it, before noon, we had pretty much used up all my itinerary for the entire week. <laughs> <laughs> because they knew as much about the technical side of operating okay an iphone as i did i mean right. they really knew all the they knew all the bells and whistles right and so i had to scramble mm -hmm. and i came up with i said all what i have to offer them is my thoughts on the photographs they shoot right that's that's going to be the, the key to this week and so i I, gr I grabbed a bunch of props like a colander and a hammer and a pitchfork and you know a birdhouse and and i had in this moment of complete inspiration i said you and here's the kicker you guys it's a competition you're all going to photograph the birdhouse but this is going to be a competition and all of them girls boys they went yes <laughs> So we had to make a big scorecard up on the wall. Oh, it can't know. just be homework. You know, it has to be like you get a prize or something. This has sure. to be fun. I mean, That's I mean, right. I, I got to right. tell you something. Uh, uh, summer camp workshops for kids. They got to be fun. That's right. That's right. And and so we had Anthony, the intern, the college student. He was the official judge. So I could wash my hands of it. Oh, good. And move. everybody would get three minutes with every object. And we'd rotate them around and mm. organize them. And I taught them how to organize their pictures and how to edit the pictures afterwards to make them look really good. But what I wanted, what I wanted to get to was like, I had th at least three kids there. Like when I first met them, I'm thinking, I can't even picture what their photographs are going to look like. Mm. And yet when they like this, this kid, I said, here, you got to photograph, you know, it's your turn to photograph the birdhouse. And, and I, I said, now, what do you think you're going to do? You know, you got to think this through. And he goes, I don't have to think this through. I know what I'm going to do. Okay. And, ab absolutely. And we went out, he took that birdhouse right out into the middle of the street. It's a, not a busy street yes. and put it right down in the middle of the street and laid down on his stomach. So there's a birdhouse in the middle of the street and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And he, he already knew what he wanted to do. And I found them to be very decisive for one thing. Right. They did not think very long about what they, how they were going to photograph stuff. They went with their gut reaction. And at the end of the week, I made a video uh, and, where I reviewed every kid's work. Right. And so I, and so I'd say, and it was, it, I, I made it on my iPhone, this little video. And I said, this is Carter. 
I put his name up and there's a picture of Carter. Carter was a was perhaps the most decisive of the decisive photographers this week. And I show five pictures taken by Carter. Look at these pictures. He 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 knew exactly what he was going to do with that pen that jar of pencils. Mm. You know? And so I made this video. And then we put it out on on the web and the parents got to see it and they could mm. share it with grandparents and all this. And um everybody not everybody but many people who watched it came to me and said i i had zero expectations for what kind of work these kids were going to do and yet every single kid produced photographs worthy of conversation or worthy of putting up on the wall and i i may have helped them some but I, what I really gave them was the framework for like, let's have a competition, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> and I made it fun for them. I made it fun for them. And because um, I, I can promise you all of those kids, I mean, if you sign up, if your mom signs you up for a smartphone photography summer course, you probably have something going on to begin with. But they all really it was it was uh, it was amazing so you know, i'm thinking as you're talking that this is a generation that you worked with that is used to the iphone and used to taking absolutely. pictures totally of yeah. everything and so it perhaps is easier to be decisive because you take a picture you don't like it you take another one you know you're not waiting for the film to be yeah. developed yeah 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 and so if you had done this project 20 years ago yeah. with, I don't know, a Polaroid, for instance, or yeah. whatever, yeah. Um, they might have been more thoughtful. They might have been, yes. Maybe no less interesting and talented, but yeah. the culture was different. And so their approach, yeah. I think, would be different. You know, yeah. I think that has something yeah. to do with what goes on. And of course, just giving kids that opportunity can unleash, you don't even know what's there, like you said, but yeah, there right. it comes. Let me, let me tell you how careful my mother was with her Kodak Instamatic camera. Mm -hmm. She got, she always wanted a camera. My dad gave her a camera and this is like a big deal. You know, I, I know the price, it was 1995. So yeah. A lot of money then, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. So she got this camera, she was so happy. She was so careful with that camera, my sister, this is true. This is absolutely true. My sister grew up on that camera in <laughs> one roll of 12. <laughs> There's Jill as a baby. There's Jill starting kindergarten. I'm not kidding. Here's Jill in the third grade. Then we got wow. the roll of film and it worked. It worked. Pretty amazing. Yeah. The different ways that yeah. we document our lives yeah. and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And the way those the way those kids like I, on that Monday morning when I was starting out when I was like um, uh, teaching them, you know, okay, here's one. You're gonna love this one. You're gonna love this one. I said, watch this. If you hold your finger on the screen, you know, hold your finger on the screen. Let's see. I'll even do it. For you. And then you let's see. Let's see. Camera open. Okay. All right. And you and 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 you hold it there, and then you can slide your finger up and down. And it'll make the picture darker or brighter. Let's see here. You teaching Let's me see. something new? Yeah, right. Okay. And I have taught that. See this? Can you see it? Yes, I do. I can see. It. Yeah. Okay. And so I have taught that to grown-ups. And I have actually, I actually had a woman start crying. Like, oh my God, you can do that? <laughs> yes, you can. You can fix your exposures on your iPhone, right? Okay, so, and it is. I mean, I, I, if I go to a group of 30 people, uh, grownups, right. most of them don't know about that. And I was gonna say, go, I'm anxious now to try it later on my phone, right? I mean, pe right. yeah, people say to me, that was worth the whole workshop right there. 
There you go. Is that okay, what you're fine. trying, Beatrice? Beatrice is over there trying it. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so I did it for the kids, right? I go in with right. the kids and I'm going like this. And, and, and they're the like, boy, yeah, we know that. One of the, yeah, right. One of the boys looks at me and he goes, who doesn't know that? <laughs> and I said, well, there's a lady <laughs> in Omaha. And the lady cried. in Omaha. I swear to God, she's an idiot. What can I tell you? <laughs> Oh, she must be an adult. I can hear the yeah. kids and roll on their right, eyes. Right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so it's a whole different uh, situation. Wow. So you've been in many different kinds of situations, um, you know, in the different ways you've worked and what you've learned and what you've shared and changing during the pandemic several times at least. Yeah. So... Am I right in assuming that you have hope for the future? I feel hopeful. I, I do feel hopeful for the future. I, I, I think that people are good. Mm. And I think that human beings are going to figure out the, uh, the climate, the environment. I do believe that. Mm. And... I'm a little, uh, on the other hand, I'm a little worried for my two young boys who they're mm -hmm. going to grow up with this stuff and like, what's, what's it going to be in 25 years? Right. Um, but most generations, I'm sure, I don't know if our parents thought about it as directly, but maybe when, if someone was a child of the fifties and there was the Bay of Pigs with President uh, yeah, Kennedy, right. yeah. your parents could have had reason to pause and to say, what's the future like for my children? I can only imagine. Yeah. Or, you know, when different kinds of technology or machines come into being, what kind of future is my kid going to have having to use that? You know, I do. Uh, yeah, I think I think that probably if we were able to talk to all different generations, we would learn that, that they would be fearful or hopeful or confused by how the future would be for their children. And yet here we all are saying, this is what we've accomplished. This is what we have not taken care of fully. Oh yeah, I gotta turn my... There we go. And, and then we say, and this is what still has to be done, whether we're talking about being kind to one another or climate change or how to adjust the exposure <laughs> on your iPhone, you know, we can all be learning and growing. So it's nice to know because being hopeful for the future to me means that we have a future because if we don't have hope, what do we got? That's right. Right, right. I, well, I, I am not very hopeful for the future of rock and roll music, though, I have to tell you. And why is that? That's interesting. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Oh, I thought maybe. I'm, okay, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you. I gotta, I'm going to tell you. I got to yes. address this. Okay. A, this guy's on the internet. He's on YouTube. Right. And he's like a 27-year-old hardcore rap singer. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he does a really cool thing that he has his producer put a piece of music into the sound system and he's never heard of the song and he's never heard of the performer. Okay. And that guy, and they play the whole song, it's three minutes and 12 seconds. And he sits there and talks through it. And he's like, here's my reaction. And he, so the he goes what's the name what's the song this week and and he goes day no no uh gordon light feet gordon lightfoot he can't even say you know gordon light feet okay and the name of the song is if you could read my mind right okay all right so he's just sitting there just like i'm sitting here right now and they play the music and then it in comes the little guitar intro then Gordon Lightfoot's voice comes in, which was tremendous. Do you are you old enough to remember? I am. Okay. And and this guy start. He's nodding his head, and he goes, "Oh my God, 
this is beautiful. Mm. This is beautiful. And he listens to the whole song and he goes, oh, listen to those strings coming in in the background. That's mm. genius, you know? And oh, this is, oh, 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 oh. And then he goes, the song ends and he goes, that was incredible. Mm. That was so beautiful. And he goes, you know what's the, he says, you know what's wrong with the music that my generation's making? What's that? He goes, it's all shit. <laughs> Well, there's being honest and direct. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, you know, I don't know. If you, I, I'm, 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 I'm not a big rap music guy. If you ever want to mm -hmm. hear something really funny, go listen to Keith Richards. There's a two minute YouTube movie about him talking about how he, how much he hates rap music. <laughs> it's hilarious. But anyway, okay. Enough about rap music. Uh, rock and roll will continue in some format. It will. It will. Seventies yeah. will have a retro day, or you know, whatever's going to happen. You know. Well, I'll tell you a music story then. Oh, good. As as sharing. Okay. Um, I had heard I follow um, Tony Bennett on Facebook, and had always wanted to go to his con one of his. And he's like a hundred now, right? Ninety-five, but you're close. I okay. I exaggerated. Well, not by much. Okay. Um, and I had Tony heard, Bennett's one of my favorites. I my love friend. Tony Bennett. See, and we're getting along even better now. This is great. I know. I, know. I love. I love Tony Bennett. So I heard he was going to have um, two concerts, and one was on his ninety-fifth birthday, and one was two nights later at Radio City Music Hall in New York. And he was going to be with Lady Gaga, and they have sung oh, together yeah. before and are yeah, friends. Yeah. yeah. I asked a girlfriend to go. She wasn't able to go. And I thought, well, all right, that's the end of that. And two days before on that Tuesday, I was telling somebody else and they were like, you should just go, you know? And I thought to myself, first of all, you've always wanted to do this. How many seriously more opportunities are you going to get? Because the None. concert was called one last time. Okay. Was it? Yeah. And they were talking about saying goodbye to New York because that's where they're both from. And I was like, I'm doing this. I checked, there were still tickets available. Called my girlfriend. Yes, she's got a place in the city. I can stay there, no problem. Then I proceeded to be in touch with all my clients that I had planned for that Thursday. Let's see where I can move everyone. Got everyone moved except maybe two and I saw them early in the morning. That night I say to my husband, oh, by the way, I'm going out of the concert Thursday. And he knew I'd been thinking about it. And he said, you're just telling me? I said, you know what? I just bought the tickets like 10 minutes ago. And they were over $400, which was a stretch, but I was going. Yeah. I jumped in my convertible. It was a beautiful day. I drove down, all singing and happy. Got there, pulled into her condo, quick took a shower and took a cab up to Radio City Music Hall. And it was the most phenomenal musical experience of my entire life. Uh, it was fabulous. First of all, my seat, it just turned out. I was near the front, but not in the, you know. I'm so public. happy for you. It was great. I met two people next to me. We talked throughout the whole thing. It was a sold out performance. There were seats on the stage, you know, high top tables and chairs, yeah, yeah, yeah. $60,000 seats, 15,000 down below. Okay. So my price seemed like a real bargain and I wasn't in the nosebleed section. Lady Gaga came out, she sang for about a half an hour, had no idea how really unbelievable her singing yeah. voice is. Yeah, she can sing. She can sing. Yeah. And she talked about her love. She went to go sing a, a jazz song and she said, this is the song that I sang the first night I met Mr. Bennett. And I was at a charity event, sang the song. And then someone came up to me and said, Mr. Bennett would like to meet you. And she's like, me? And yes, Mr. Bennett wants to meet you. And she was like, oh no. All she could think about, she said, was the red dot she had all over her face and some crazy outfit on. She went back to her dressing room and said, Get this shit off of me. I have to wear something proper to go meet Mr. Bennett. She went there. Of course, he knew who she was. And he said, you're a jazz singer. 
and I want to make an album with you. And wow. that's what started their relationship wow. personally and professionally. And she sang that song that night and others. And then a little bit later, um, curtains went down. Tony came out and sang for 95, for almost any age, actually. Phenomenal voice, still strong. And he has Alzheimer's. Okay. Dementia. Tony he's, does? Yes. He's had it in about five years now. And on the piano, leaning and tapping his fingers, you know, perfect, remembering everything he needed to remember for these songs. And then he came, she came out and they sang songs together. You know, I was standing and clapping and crying and enjoying the whole time. And at the very end, she took his arm and she said, Mr. Bennett, can I escort you off the stage one last time? Oh. Well, now we were all crying. And she, she's walking off slowly, and they were uh, filming it. It's going to be a TV special in a couple of months. And she's walking off very measured, and there's a camera ahead. And he stops. He's shaking the piano player's hand and the saxophone player's hand. It was a little bit to get him off the stage. And I was saying to anyone I saw that night or later, that was his last performance. It was it his last performance? Well, it wasn't meant to be. He had others scheduled in Connecticut and other places. Wow. But his doctor said that um, his mind was kept pretty sharp because of the singing engagements up to the pandemic. And then because he couldn't perform after that, it was no longer medically appropriate um, and advise against him. And so I actually did see his very last performance. Oh, no kidding. Oh, right. That's great. Isn't that amazing? That's, it was amazing. That's great. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's very great. Save so, your ticket stub. Save your ticket stub. Oh, I didn't even think of that. It's on my phone. See, it's not even paper. Well, print it, <laughs> <laughs> well, print it out and sell it on eBay. <laughs> You know what? That would have never crossed my mind. Not a bad idea, but maybe I'll just frame it instead. <laughs> there are people that, that like collect. I saw, I, I think I have this right. Some guy collected mm -hmm. a ticket stub from every Eagles concert, oh. from every Eagles concert, everyone, everyone. And there's, you know, I don't know how many there are, 140. And it's mm. worth $2.2 .2 million, you know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, all of them. You know, it's like that. It's I just made that up. I don't want your uh, listeners to go out and. Oh, well, gee, here I thought. Out. Now I know how to change the exposure, and maybe I'll be rich because of the ticket. But really, it's just the exposure that I've learned for today. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. Hey, do you want me to tell you my buddy Holly story, or sure. should I we, we no, save it for the next for show? No, no, okay. go for it. So I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. Buddy Holly took off from Iowa on an airplane at midnight and it crashed in Iowa, but he was on his way to my hometown, Fargo. So I always grew up with Buddy Holly. Buddy mm. Holly's like a, a Fargo deal, despite the fact that he never went there. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, uh, uh, fast forward, he crashed, he died. Okay. I was working at the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer and I saw an article in the paper that said, Buddy Holly's glasses and wallet and other stuff, the change from his pocket were found in a lost envelope in the, in the courthouse in uh, whatever town, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Mm. And they found it and they returned it to his wife, Maria Elena Holly. So I had a friend who was the number two person at Rolling Stone magazine and the 25th anniversary of Buddy Holly's death was coming up. And I called up Carolyn White and I said, Carolyn, will you guys send me to, to Texas to go to Maria Elena's house and I'll take a picture of the glasses that Buddy Holly was wearing when he died. And you can make that a special deal in Rolling Stone, a big right. picture of the glasses. Okay. So she ma she makes all the phone calls, tracks her down because here's where she lives. You're gonna go there next Thursday, blah blah blah. So I go to Maria Elena's house. I got all this fancy photography equipment. 
she's in the and I, I have to tell you I'm a huge Buddy Holly fan mm. I love Buddy Holly I love Buddy Holly okay so I go to her house. She's as nice as can possibly be. She's like cute and she's just so sweet. And so she's watching me set up all the stuff and I'm photographing these glasses and they're kind of bent and twisted because he, yeah. he was wearing them in a plane crash, yeah. right? And, and so I, she watches me photograph and she, and she said, I'm taking a photography class right now. Would you mind if I asked a bunch of questions about photography? Not at all. So I gave her a little photography lesson as I was photographing her husband's glasses. Mm -hmm. So then I said, okay, I'm done. And she said, can I play with your camera a little bit? Sure. And she playing with the camera. I'm showing her how to use it. We had lights set up and I said, how, how about this? And, and I, I know this sounds odd, but she was completely fine with it. I said, how about this? I'll put the glasses on and you take a picture of me. She goes, sure. I put on Buddy Holly's glasses. She takes a picture of me wearing his glasses. I now have a photograph of myself wearing Buddy Holly's glasses taken by his widow. Wow. Yeah, I know. And it's so I got there's there's all kinds of little angles on the story. But so then they opened up a Buddy Holly museum in Lubbock, Texas, which is where he is from. It's mm -hmm. like, it's the number one tourist thing in Lubbock, not that there's any competition, but hey, whatever. And so the, I, I, I got on their site and if you have any Buddy Holly stories, send them in. So I, I, wrote, I wrote the long version of this story and I sent it in. So I get this phone call, the director, and I sent the picture. Mm. And, and the director of the museum calls me up and she goes, I just got your, your email. She goes, this is unbelievable. She said, first of all, you got to get these glasses are the centerpiece of our museum. It's the most iconic thing of Buddy Holly were the glasses he was wearing when he died. So they're in a case all by themselves when you walk into the museum, right? <clears throat> and she said, the very idea that you have a photograph taken by Maria of Lena, wearing them is just like, I can't even wrap my head around it. Anyway, that's my Buddy Holly story. When you were wearing the glasses, could you sing like yeah. him too? Did that come into no. your? No, that did not happen. No, okay. that did not happen. <laughs> I tried, I tried that. I tried that before I wore the glasses. It didn't work <laughs> then either. <laughs> All right, one last story and we're gone. Yeah. Um, so I went to school in Long Island, New York. Uh, Hicksville High School. And Billy Joel went to the school. Well, he was enrolled there. I don't know how often he went, but, um, and he played at my, hmm, I think it was the senior prom, the Haskins. Did he? Did he? Yeah, it was the junior or senior prom. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't someone that we hung around with because he was one of the bad boys, you know, uh -huh. fast and loose. Okay. Um, and after, I mean, we don't know each other. But once in a while, I'd see him at a diner or someplace like that. Okay. Fast forward, I'm living on Long Island. I'm married. And um, my husband is going to do a job in Center Island, which is one of the places Billy lived. If he wasn't out at the end of the island um, at a fishing place, he was up in Center Island. And it's literally an island and you have to cross over and there's a, a security guard in a little gatehouse kind of thing. So my husband, who perhaps maybe looks like Billy Joel, um, comes up to the, the gatehouse and the guard says, of course, go right in, Mr. Mr. Joel, go right in. <laughs> and off my husband goes, and he's, you know, sends me a text. Yeah. Right, of course, he, he drives there, goes to whatever customer's house he's going to. He's a mechanical engineer, so it's heating, air conditioning, whatever he's doing. Okay. And he does whatever job that is. And he's coming off the island, same guy, he's at the uh, gatehouse. And he starts to wave him through, have a good day, thank you, Mr. Joe. You're not Billy Joel. <laughs> My husband said, I never said I was, I just didn't want to argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> So my husband comes home and he's all excited to tell me the story. 
And so then I asked them the question I asked you. I said, so can you sing like him now? Like you, you'll be raised up in my book if you can start to sing. Like and he goes, damn it, nope. <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So it's amazing the different connections we have of different people in music or other ways to see the world, to experience the world. You know, it's just excellent. Well, uh, such gratitude, I feel. Oh, thanks. That you I came and we it. spoke yeah. and you shared. This was special, just uh, Special thanks to Beatrice for her high-end engineering. Mm -hmm. it's thank been, you, Beatrice. She's shaking her head and says, thank you back. And I know that my audience is really going to enjoy hearing about your different adventures and maybe different information than they've learned up until now. Um, so if you could give me the information of how they could look you up, read your books, go on your website. What sure. do you have? Right now, here. Right now. Mm -hmm. um, it's, the website is how to photograph your life. That's one word, mm -hmm. dot com. Our Facebook page is how to photograph your life. Um, and that is where you can post photographs that you've taken Beautiful. and you just never know how far they will rise up the food chain. And, uh, I mean, we could do a whole conversation. I, I won't go on long here. We could do a whole conversation on the quality of amateur photographs and what they have access to and how having a camera in their hands when real life happens is professionals can't even compete with that. It's it's mind blowing the stuff that uh, this, that amateurs get, and um, I love it. And, and what I would like to do is hear about all of that information, and then yeah. show the photos that you're speaking. Absolutely. Of. So I could come on and show ten photographs. I mean, talk about right. ten. And I would like to have different age groups, the kids, sure. all different age groups and separate from one another. And then tell us what they see in the photographs, what they see the person thinking or yeah. what they think is going on. Yeah. I think that would be fascinating. It would Excellent. be. Okay. One moment. Beatrice, let's book them. That's great. Okay. Yeah, we're that, done. that would we're be done. fun. That would be really fun. That that would, really and fun. we'll do it. And we'll do it. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Thank okay. you so much for being just my a pleasure guest my here pleasure. on the podcast from heartache to healing and hope. Thank you. <laughs>